It's uh, wonderful that uh, so many of you all managed to come today on a Sunday, and I'm sure you will not leave disappointed. So I would like everyone to stand for the national anthem. seated. We'd now like to light the traditional oil lamp and I would like to invite the following dignitaries. Uh, first, Dr. Mayurudhan, the president of the Ceylon College of Cardiology. Sri Lanka College of Cardiology, Mayurudhan, please. Next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mark Silvestri, who is well known to all of us and a leading interventional cardiologist from France. Next, can we have Dr. Chandrika Pennan Piruma, who is our president elect? And Dr. Sampath Vitanavasam, who is responsible for the success of today's program. We'll also like to invite our senior cardiologists who are here, uh, Dr. Mohan Jayatilaka and Dr. Jayanti Manajayavadana. We'd also like to invite Dr. Roshan Paranamana. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so it's a real pleasure and a very good morning to have to see all of you all and to have all of you all here. And that so much of you, or of you all thought of spending your Sunday morning here is also a great thing. Uh, first, I'd like to give a special thank you to Dr. Vajira Senratna, who unfortunately is not here today. Uh, because of his dedication and hard work, uh, this course has actually uh, been organized in a very short period of time. Also, a very special thank you goes out to Dr. Mayurdhan and the organizing committee for having helped to put this together. So I don't think any of you all are going to be disappointed today because we have actually a very elegant lineup of lectures and there are some well-known uh, leading cardiologists to be delivering these lectures. So they say that knowledge is the pathway to success. And I'm sure that all of you all will leave here more knowledgeable 
and hopefully this would all relate to better patient outcomes and better patient management. So without much ado, I would uh, like to uh, start now and um, maybe uh, like to invite our uh, chairpersons for the first session which we will be on the basics of coronary intervention. I'd like to invite Dr. Sanjeeva Rajapaksa, Dr. Sampath Vitanavasam and Dr. Dishna Amaratunga. Um, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Mark Silvestri. He actually requires no introduction to this audience. He is a leading interventional cardiologist uh, practicing at uh, Clinic Axion in France, where he does more than 300 PCIs a year. He also has been a live operator as well as a speaker in many international conferences. So over to you, Mark, who will be speaking on catheters in challenging cases. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's always a great pleasure and an honor to come back to this uh, lovely island of Sri Lanka and to meet again uh, your good friends. Uh, today, uh, I, I will try to once again to make the things very simple. The, this is the basis. This is the, the catheter. Can you connect me, or please? This is only uh, a lecture about the catheter, which is uh, seems to be very simple, but uh, you will see that uh, for the, uh, mainly for the young uh, interventional cardiologists that this is the uh, probably uh, a key, a very important point uh, for diagnostic as well as for intervention. So what is, uh, what is a catheter exactly? It seems to be simple. This, this question seems to be very simple and but uh, you have to know uh, the, the material, the characteristic of the catheter. Uh, usually, of course, we have a hub, a lure lock to connect with the pressure. We have a shaft also, uh, a secondary curve, which is important, the primary curve, and the tip of the catheter, which must be very soft. So all those characteristics must be known when you start to do interventions. So, of course, the catheter is used to inject the contrast, to, to check the pressure, which is also very important. The classical length is one meter. You, you can find also a catheter of 125 uh, centimeter when the patient are very tall and when you have tortuosity, sometimes it's useful. The tip must be uh, atraumatic because, of course, this is the, one of the major risks of intubate uh, coronary vessel is to have a osteal dissection, which is very often a, a, a nightmare. And the shaft also must be solid enough to resist to the torque that we use sometimes to cannulate and also must be answer, must also answer properly when you need to torque it to, to reach the, the ostium of the, the coronaries. So the catheter selection is to me essential uh, for diagnostic as well as for intervention. Uh, for only one reason is that uh, for diagnostic as well as for intervention, you must get a perfect cannulation in terms of opacification and in terms of risk. This is a balance which is very important. For the diagnostic, you must nowadays have a perfect opacification of the vessel so that you can get a perfect analysis of the lesions because we all know that it's very difficult uh, to uh, really uh, quantify the lesions uh, and geographically, so if the opacification is not correct, then you can miss some lesion and you can advise wrong diagnostics to the, to the patients. And for interventions, the role of the catheter is mainly the support. Of course, you can do opacification as well, but this has been done by the angiogram previously, normally. So the support is, you will see, essential for good interventions. Then the catheter selection can, can change uh, according to the approach, radial or femoral. Uh, you must also think uh, using this or this catheter according to the anatomy that you have to face when the ostium of the vessel takeoff is a little bit different. Sometimes you have to change. The vessel size that you have to tackle also is important if you have tortuosity or not. The type of lesions particularly the calcification. With the anatomy you have to face, you must anticipate and select the catheter uh, appropriately. And one more point, which is most important, you have to try to anticipate the difficulties and more the complications and the tools that you may need 
in case of prompt calculation with the catheter you have. Because sometimes, for example, if you start with a six French catheter for a CTO, and that you, you have to need a stingray, for example, which needs a seven French, you won't be able to continue the procedure and you have to stop it. So the anticipation is very important. Uh, uh, one important point also is not very, very uh, common uh, nowadays, but you will see that more and more the functional assessment uh, will become the routine in a couple of years. We use in my center very often the FFR and now the QFR. So the quality of opacification during an angiogram is essential to calculate the QFR. And of course the tools, as I said previously, that you will have to use is essential if you plan to do a rotor, uh, orbital laterectomy, or any other tools. Of course, this selection of the catheter is essential. So the approach, when you use a catheter, you know that uh, if you go by your radial approach, you will have to face some difficulties sometimes. The, the right radial approach is the one that we use the most common because we are, most of us are right-handed. Uh, but we must know that there is a kink, uh, usually at the, at the subclavian, at the right subclavian, and an angulation which doesn't help sometimes. But in the other hand, if you go to the left radial, sometimes for the back of the operator, it's a little bit more difficult, depending on the size of the, of the patient, it's more difficult. And you must know that in about 15% of the cases in men and 28% of the cases in the women, the size of the radial artery is less than six French. That, that's also an important point. The femoral approach, usually uh, most of us uh, know about that. It's a very old and common uh, approach. Uh, we have to function uh, above the uh, bifurcation. The echo guidance is nowadays more and more recommended to reduce the complication rate, uh, depending on the size of the catheter, of course, but it can rise up to 6%. Uh, and of course, it may be useful for very complex procedure. Uh, usually, it's more comfortable uh, when you have to deal with a complex left main trifurcation or a large vessel, sometimes seven or eight French catheter through the femoral approach will give you better support. The catheter diagnostic must be known also. You must uh, know that the sheet, of course, is a little bit bigger than the catheter itself. And the comparison between the catheter diagnostic and the uh, angioplasty uh, catheter is mainly uh, made uh, at the inner uh, lumen, lumen, the inner diameter, of course, which is uh, larger in the guiding catheter than it is with the diagnostic catheter. I always start, of course, with classical uh, Jetkins or uh, for diagnostic, Jetkins right or Jetkins left, of course. Uh, be uh, aware of uh, dissection, as I said previously. Always check the pressure before injection. Always aspirate is something also which is very basic, very, very academic and very simple. But sometimes uh, when you start your training, one can forget that and that can occur, uh, give a Severe dissection sometime. Uh, for diagnostic, you can use four French also. Some, uh, some of us are using four French uh, catheter. It, it, it is feasible by automatic injection or manually, but you have to be careful and push the, the contrast a little bit more strongly. Once again, whatever you select, four or five, the, the quality of opacification must be perfect. Regarding the, the shape that we have, you know that uh, we have many, many. Uh, many shapes of um, catheter diagnostic and uh, um, for angioplasty as well. Um, most of the time we use uh, jet skins right, jet skins left, but uh, you know that uh, we can use also, depending of the anatomy, uh, other, other shapes. So we are going to see together uh, the more classical first. This is a jet skins uh, injection. You can see that we have different uh, curved, we can, for a sh short, uh, small uh, uh, lady, for example, you can use a GL3 or GL3.5. Most of the time, it's easy to cannulate the left main and injection. And when you have a uh, big man, usually, or, or large aorta, then you have to move sometimes to the Jelkins left four, Jelkins left, left five. Uh, the projection is mainly the AP or the LAO, 30 degrees, but it depends on each operator, of course. Uh, regarding the uh, Jetkins, the right cannulation, 
I think you all know that you, we must uh, talk clockwise the catheter until you can uh, cannulate. Be careful not to deep throat because sometimes when you clockwise turn clockwise, the catheter is going very quickly and very deeply. If it happens, don't panic, just vac uh, aspirate. You, you can be inside the vessel with the sex fringe with, without any damping. The most important is to have uh, the pressure and to have, um, to can va evacuate some blood. In this case, you can inject. Other difficult case, a large aorta or aneurysm. So in this case, the implants left will be of course very useful. Implants left two or even implants left three or GL5, as I said previously. Uh, once again, be careful with the uh, implants higher risk of dissection, and when you pull back the, uh, the implants, don't forget to, to push instead of pulling back, because if you pull back the implants, it will go deeper in the, and deep throat the, the coronary artery and may have a, a dissection. It's the same for the right, with the implants right, uh, right, same, be coaxial, be sure of the pressure, inject properly, and remove the catheter by pulling instead of pulling back pushing instead of pulling back. A few words about um, bypass. Uh, we have a special catheter, you know, uh, IMA, internal mammary artery, that so you can use by femoral or by <coughs> radial approach. Left, so depending on the bypass of, of your patient, of course, but by femoral, usually it's a little bit tricky. You have to go with the, uh, I suggest to, to go with the terimo Y, because as soon as you start to try to go in the uh, subclavian, you may uh, increase the risk of distal embolization, so use the terimo Y, which is very floppy, instead of the, uh, the JY, and try to catch the mammary, which is not easy it, sometimes, especially the right, uh, ma the right mammary by the femoral approach. Sometimes it's a little bit tricky, but uh, most of the time we can manage. You can see this patient who had two mammary, uh, has been uh, cannulated with the same uh, IMA catheter, five French. For the saphenous vein graft, uh, we have, uh, of course, the possibility uh, to catch them with the Jetkins, Jetkins right. Most of the time, they start from the uh, anterior right uh, wall of the aorta, and the, for the saphenous right, uh, the, you can use the uh, Jetkins. Same for the saphenous left, but we have speci specific catheter called RCB and LCB, which are very comfortable also, and most of the time, if you cannot cannulate, you can use also multipurpose or amplest right or amplest left, depending on the takeoff of the, uh, the saphenous bypass. Uh, one catheter I really appreciate and that I use uh, every day. I start uh, in 90%, 95% of the cases, my angiogram with the tiger. You can see, uh, this is an angiogram I did uh, at the beginning of this week. Here we can go, uh, so it takes three minutes to, uh, an angiogram must take three minutes nowadays. You inject the left, and then you pull back and turn clockwise and go to the right, and then do two true projections on the right, and then the angiogram is over in two, three minutes. So it's one catheter for two vessels. Mainly it's from the radial approach. It's more difficult with the, uh, through the, uh, left radial, if you are uh, using left radial, and it's quite almost impossible by the femoral route. But if you use a radial approach, you can use the tiger and save one catheter, which is cheaper also. Um, for vertical takeoff, which is uh, quite uh, common also, sometimes the right is difficult to cannulate. You can see this uh, right was difficult to cannulate with the uh, uh, tiger. So I switched to the multipurpose. I could dilate this lesion. The multipurpose is a catheter which is going down, which can cannulate uh, easily, and you are really coaxial and straight to the lesion. Then you can cross it very quickly and get a good result with one stent uh, with the multipurpose one or two. Complex anatomy or anormal anatomy, you must uh, be careful with the uh, uh, an anormal uh, anatomy, uh, particularly for the, the right, uh, and this dangerous inter aortic uh, pulmonary uh, right coronary uh, artery, which is sometimes responsible of sudden death in young patients. We had recently a young lady of 28 years old 
who had uh, cardiac arrest and resuscitation who had this kind of pathology. So it's very difficult to cannulate. Uh, the CT scan, of course, can help in this indication. And to catch, to catch it, most of the time, you have to use an M plus left two, or it's sometimes uh, an M plus left three, uh, and talk uh, clockwise to, to cannulate it properly. So here is the, uh, the different uh, function of the catheter and how to select a, catheter, a guiding catheter for angioplasty. First, the size. So you must know uh, perfectly uh, all the size and what you can do with different sizes of the guiding catheter. Uh, for, so I will go first to the different size. Most of the time we use, of course, six and seven in our daily practice. We can do um, angioplasty in five French uh, guiding catheter. You know, the inner lumer is 0 0.58 and 0 0.59, so it's very, very, very small. Um, be careful, always think that what I was saying at the beginning, always think that everything can happen. So if you decide to go for a five French in the same session of angiogram, for example, we do uh, in our center about 60% of ADOC angioplasty, so we are in five French. We want to stay in five French. We have a lesion in front of us. It's easy to, this, to say, okay, I take a five French and do this lesion, but let's see if we have a complex dissection, a perforation, or anything can happen. You cannot be able to put a, a, another device in five French, so it will be a nightmare. So select five French only if really you have no other choice, and if it is a very simple lesion, a type A lesion of a marginal or, or of a right, for example, but even for a marginal, you can have a left main dissection, everything can happen. Be careful, and I recommend uh, to switch to six French, which is the size of routine angioplasty nowadays, you can do quite everything. Bifurcation, IVUS, OCT, ROTA with burr of 1.5, 1 up to 1.75. And seven French will be used as we did yesterday for a large vessel complex uh, CTOs, uh, ROTA with the burr of uh, more than 1.75 to use microcat and so on. Uh, 8 French, to be honest, I don't use any more 8 French for many years. It's only for very big bird that we don't use most of the time, or very complex procedure. For sometimes you have to do a SKS technique in the left main in a very large vessel. It can be useful, but it's very uh, few cases. Let's go back to the uh, selection of the catheter. The catheter must be very coaxial. That's a very important point. The intubation of the vessel also is essential. And you have to know the catheter bends, uh, the geometry also characteristic of the um, diameter of the support point. Uh, for example, if you go to the, uh, the main <coughs> catheter that we use in the left system, the extra backup, you can see that the, uh, when you use a, a Jetkins, the point of uh, support of the catheter is, is very, very small comparing to extra backup where you have a curve which is against the contralateral wall of the uh, aorta, which give, give us a, a very good support. This is a, an example of a case uh, I did also uh, last week. Not very complex lesion of the distal cirque, but you can see the, the curve, the bend. We must keep in mind that the circumflex is a posterior vessel. So with this extra backup, with this curve, which is against the control lateral wall of the aorta. You have a very good support, and if you have to do the LAD also, you just have to talk clockwise or opposite clockwise when the left man is short like this, and you can go with the same catheter, both alternatively uh, towards the circ or towards the EVA, yeah, the LED, sorry. So in this case, the, the guy Y could cross uh, easily, and I even did a direct stenting on this lesion with a DES, without predilatation, and you can see the, the result uh, on, this, uh, on this view here. The result was optimum with a direct stenting, despite this curve of the circ, just because the support of the extra backup, which was a six French 3.75 guiding catheter, the support was excellent. And this you can feel from the beginning, when you inject or when you cross with a Y, you can feel that the support is good, though you may try to do a direct stenting. 
Same for right coronary guiding catheter. The one that we use routinely is the Jetkins or the M plus right, but you may use the M plus left also. You know that you have to talk clockwise. The M plus left, depending on the takeoff of the right, can be very useful, mainly for CTO sometimes where you need a good support. Uh, you probably know how to manipulate an M plus right, just also talk, talk clockwise. And once again, be careful when the catheter go inside, check the pressure first, never inject before checking the pressure or um, evacuate some blood. The deep intubation sometimes provides some damping, so uh, should we use side hole for that? You have advantage and disadvantage. Uh, of course, no damping, but disadvantage with need for more contrast injection uh, to be honest, with the six French guiding catheter, usually we don't need uh, uh, the sidol and we don't use any more that kind of sidol catheter. So how to increase the support of guiding catheter? Of course, you can also change in the sheet. Uh, you can use long sheet because of sometimes kinking. Do not hesitate uh, to change the sheet, the size of the sheet, of course. Uh, change the route. If you have some tortuosity by the radial, do not hesitate to go by femoral approach. And of course, use catheter and extension. Nowadays, it's very, very uh, uh, important to know how to use um, extension catheter. Uh, my two favorite are the telescope from Medtronic and of course, Getzilla from uh, Boston Company. It, it's quite uh, very easy to, to use. First, you have to cross the lesion, of course, with a Y, put the balloon, dilate the lesion, and during the deflation of the balloon, you will push with your left hand the uh, extension catheter during the inflation as quickly as possible. Then you can deep throat up to the, to down to the right coronary, for example, in this case, and then prepare all the support for the next step, which is the stenting in difficult case. And of course, the, uh, the top of the top is CTO nowadays, the, uh, the use of catheter uh, and the uh, importance of catheter is now because uh, of CTO. We need for complex CTO like this, uh, simultaneous injection. So the selection of the catheter in this case is probably the most important because you know that the procedure will take sometimes two, three hours. So we need to have a perfect uh, stability and support of the catheter. So for the left coronary, for the left coronary uh, contralateral injection, once again, the extra backup is probably the best support. Seven French in this case, most of the time, why? Because uh, in seven French, you will be able to do everything during the procedure and change your strategy according to what happened during the procedure. So in this case, uh, I try by integrated approach uh, I was lucky to cross by integrate with the uh, Gaia 2. I did this case on Monday as well. And uh, you can see that uh, if I couldn't cross by the integrate approach, I was ready with the seven French extra backup to do, um, to, to go for surfing to the, to the septal with the seven French to cross with the micro cut and to try a reverse car technique, for example. So always have in mind uh, all the step of your strategy and select the catheter accordingly. So to summarize and to be short, uh, I want to give you this message. The catheter is a key of diagnostic and interventions. Uh, the quality of angiogram to decide the strategy, as I said at the beginning, is also very important. Don't forget that. The functional assessment uh, during angiogram will become a must and the standard uh, very soon, probably, because you cannot only uh, do an angiogram to a patient and not be sure that the lesions are, uh, functionally speaking, uh, significant or not. And for angioplasty, of course, the catheter gives priority to the support. So always know the ways to help your support, the approach by changing the approach, the size, the shapes, the manipulation, the catheter extension, and always think to what could happen to select the right size and the right support in case of complication. Thank you for your attention.
Dr. Silvestri for an excellent talk, actually giving us uh, tips and tricks in selection of uh, guide catheter. Uh, you have been helping us for the last 15, 20 years, I think. So, uh, in the interest of time, uh, we can allow maybe one or two questions from the audience. Subclavian, uh, what is your preferred guide of choice if you're going for the radial approach for the left and for the right coronary? In, in case of arteria lusoria, that's oh, lusoria, yeah. Uh, in case of lusoria, of course, it's, uh, it's a problem which is uh, not very common, but it happens sometimes. Uh, in this case, probably uh, the femoral approach is more comfortable, that's true, but uh, uh, I think the left radial is probably uh, the best option in this case because uh, with the right you have a lot of curiosity to go back in the uh, um, ascendant aorta and uh, the, the left is probably one of the best options, the left radial, but uh, in case of, if, if you see that you, it's very difficult to, don't spend too much time in the in the in this aorta because the risk is this is the embolization in the, in in the brain. So this I don't recommend to stay very long uh, in the aorta because we know that it's like for a carotid stenting and the majority of the embolization are due to cannulation of the aorta with uh, atherosclerosis that we can uh, move and send to the brain. Unfortunately, so in this case, if it is very difficult, I think stop and go to the femoral route. Any other questions? So, in the absence of questions, uh, we would like to thank you thank again you. for the excellent talk uh, in our usual way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor uh, Saidur Rahman Khan. He's a professor of cardiology and director of cardiac catheterization laboratory uh, in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. He is having over 16 years of experience in interventional cardiology and he has been a renowned lecturer for a lot of courses and interventional programs worldwide. I would like to invite uh, Professor Khan to deliver next lecture. Over to you, Professor Khan. Good morning, everybody. And uh just, I want to start in that way that just to be stylish is meaningless and just to be simple and easy makes the meaning. I'm talking about safe radial intervention and to see the coronaries and to treat the disease by PCI is our main goal as an interventionist. And the dude, obviously, the vascular axis is uh, either transfemoral or the transradial approach. But so to choose a vascular axis over another, is it that much important or is safety to be concerned? Here, the Plato's words I usually feel very much important that necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, about TRA, what we can see that the guidelines, trials, they usually say so, lots of papers and guidelines and trials are there. And if you see all these uh, landmark trials, the arrival matrix, arrival HTML, these are the trials for somebody's TMI has shown the benefits, the bleeding and uh, vascular complications. So for the trans approach is uh, lower than the transfemoral approach. And for ACS also, there is a traumatic uh, improvement with the transradial approach, even in case of mortal which also. And if you see the meta-analysis back in 2014 and in 2022, they have seen that the radial is better. So radial approach matters actually. Facts and fictions what about a TRA so far? There are lots of merits and obviously some potential demerits are also there, but the merits are more like improved patient comfort, lower rate of bleeding, lower rate of mortality, and there are some possible demerits like increased radiation, but it's just uh, not that much uh, in, uh, nowadays. But device restriction is there also. In fact, it is a key moment of that reason in the whole world, like in the USA and in our center also. If you see that back in, started in 2010, the real program, but in 2015, it has reached to the 99.5% and now it's 99.8%. And in US also, it is incrementally because of its safety. And we know that the first principle for coronary intervention, the first S dedicates to safety. And here is safe, no doubt. And the question is how we can make it much safer 
both for diagnostic purpose and the PCI, especially to prevent radiologic spasm, perforations, overcoming anomalies like subclavian toxicity, loops, arterial osteria, and radiology occlusions. So these are the things. And perfection for TR is started from the very beginning, including the puncture and the sheet placement, meticulous use of the pharmacological agents, especially for the spasm-like agents and appropriate catheter selections for, and also the changing the mindset for being radiologist as mass as possible. And vasculature, if we see that we are dealing actually with six sides, uh, you have both left and right radial, both left and right ulna, left and right distal radial. So, so lots and options in hand to be a radialist here. So starting that the flawless puncture, which is very, very much important in terms of a safe transradial approach, single or double wall puncture, any, any, anything, anywhere, anybody can choose that one actually, by when flown or by bare metal middle, I, it, it doesn't matter actually which way you feel comfortable, but somebody says, says or some way it says that the dual puncture, double wall puncture is a little bit, uh, has got a more success rate. Right or left radio, the talent trial, which has inspired me at that time, and I did my own trial also back in 2013, but which shows that less fluoroscopic time and less contrast agent, and, uh, and but chance of PLIT is more, which I have now. So overcoming loops, about one to two percent the radial loops in, while doing the geography. So we can we can overcome that on the back techniques or without back techniques. Sometimes people can be managed to by like using the guide wire, the chronic guide wire, so 014 or 025 with the hydrophilic guide wire, and the, which you can see here. Subclavian loops and toxicity. If you see that these are. These are the subclavian tortuosities and the roller coaster loops and the cobra loops and all these loops are easily can be manageable. Sometimes a deep breath solves the issue in a very, very simple way. And uh, so for CG, some way it is visible, overcoming any sort of deformity and malice and rather comfortable for graft engagement still or PCI, especially for complex one, gut feelings of number of interventions goes in favor of TFA for better support for large board like seven FGC. But is it possible to handle all PCI comfortably by TRA? That's a big question. Like set PCI by TRA, especially in these subsets which trembles the intervention world, like the high thrombus burden, the CTO application, and heavy calcifications, and ultimately these things are called the cheap PCI, whether it's possible by TRA. The dates while performing this TRA PCI is especially in this part of our planet, where smaller radiology diameter, and especially the female populations have much smaller diameter. And larger guide catheter movement, six French can be overcome by shitless guide catheter. Small radial diameter go for the ulna or slender PCI, like using the five French guide catheter. Inadequate guide support, increased active support can be done by alpha, gamma, and epsilon loops, like these loops, which I usually do, and I'm very much comfortable with that one to make very good support. So now I want to show some cases where this sort of chip PCI is where this pose become friends in transferial approach. Like a complex peptin in a very elderly male patient with 84 years old, she said, you can see the, that, that with the eye buses also. And here, the two, the, the, the two stand strategy of the DK crush technique was applied. And you can see that uh, that the dais was blind and all the steps of the crash was there. And the eye was pulled back, the final eye was pulled back was good and final the smile without any hiccup. This is a, a beautiful uh, angiographic picture by TRA using a six French guide catheter. It is possible. If you go for the dealing with the severe calcification by TRA, I am talking about the severe calcifications. It, like this case is a deep uh, in, in this paralysis, yeah, this pathetic picture with a two years back PCI with a stent in situ in, in, in the middle and pre and post stent segment is heavily calcified. How to deal with it by a TRA taking a six French? You can see here 
the picture, the graphic picture there. Even when we have taken a balloon, the dog body effects uh, with 2.5 LC, you can see that one. And this dog body effects, even by the scoring balloon, it was a huge dog bonus there. And then I, we have to deal with the, the IBIS, the napping ring classifications that they are even, which has not been eliminated by the ballooning. So we had to go for rota, but it's, there is a standard segment there as well with last person to do the rota for this case. So we have chosen the ideal and uh, or it, it, for this case, with a, you can see the ideal catheter. 2.5 millimeter and then the stenting and you can see the final picture here which is really really beautiful and uh, dealing with situ and bifurcation by a biradial approach if the radial artery is very small that is also possible with TRA it's, uh, you see the angiogram here and there you can see that there is a situ allergy and also a severe complex bifurcation lesion in LCX and OEM. So how we will approach this one is to, to we have to handle the CTO and we have to handle a complex true bifurcation lesion which needed an upfront two-stand strategy for this case. But the patient's radiology is so small that only can handle a five French cat catheter. We can accommodate that and so we have taken a fat French gel for left and obviously for CTO we need a dual injection and that dual injection you can see that is beautiful and then I have made the taken the special to wear and you can see that there is a beautiful alpha loop here and which make a very big a good active support to do the CTO then the stenting and the LED and also the IVS was done there. Now the complex CBL in LCX so a two-step strategy with decamine clot, it is also has been done well by providing and by radial access is there why not two fat French catheter we have taken here from the two radial axes and you can see but just only uh, just meticulous vessel preparations and all the steps of decamine clot has been applied here. The only thing is that we don't have to engage the two catheters uh, at simultaneously in the left main. That is the most important issue here. Yeah. And that's why the final picture, if you see, that is also very much uh, comforting. So this is also possible here, especially in this part of the planet, uh, what you can see here, smaller radiator to diameter, especially in female, the big concern here. And uh, that's why if you see this case also, it's a it's a primary PCI where the patient was encouraging a shock and needed uh, uh, the IABP support uh, because literally there is nothing left in the coronaries there. So what you have to plan for the PPCI to early by six French guide right, catheter by right, transradial approach for these patients. And after that, uh, and you see the, the IBP support was still there. And after ballooning, you can see how a mega LED has come out and the patient has been recovered from there uh, within seven days. And also I can, I can assure you that you have to make it slender. This is slender means if you see a 78 years old patient with CPD present as TMI, obviously even spends further procedures for this patient is uh, very much uh, complicate wound with a small radial diameter, multiple catheter manipulation is better to be avoided for these cases. So I've taken a five print chill that catheter to see the left coronary artery first. And then the same five print that I've used to calculate the RCA, which is easily possible by perfect manipulation. And then we have done the PCI in the RCA. And you can see the final picture is also beautiful here and graft visual intervention is also possible even by the right radial you can go for it or left radial is there for the graft vessel and geography and in the graft intervention like this graft which is in a primary PCI setting SVG with the highest thrombus burden is there to RCA where the thrombus expression catheter was taken then we have done the stenting there and after that you can see that the the pristine clear picture of the SVG to our CA. 
So this is so to wrap up, we can tell here that TRA is a beauty and uh, passion, both for patient comfort and safe intervention, possible or feasible in cheap PCI also. Of course, need a good and stable learning curve. And finally, yes, to demand set for the operator to be a good, strong radiologist. Thanks for patience hearing, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Saeed Rahman Khan, for your excellent lecture. As he's online, uh, we can entertain one or two questions from the audience. When you encounter yeah. this um, uh, radial artery loops, any any special tricks you follow to uh, manage those? Yeah, I, I think I have heard the question really beyond the sea, yeah, uh, staying in a, in a different place from here to talk about and to give a lecture pre-recorded. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you very much yeah. for your excellent lecture. This uh, sometimes when you do radial uh, angiograms, you encounter radial loops, uh, mm -hmm. which are sometimes very difficult to cross and uh, take the guide up. Uh, do you uh, any any special tricks you uh, follow to? Uh, yeah, what I usually do for this sort of cases, like like you can cross over to ephemeral access, no doubt about it. But but if you are very much uh, inclined with the radial approach, in that case, uh, sometimes by my previous lecture, they was told you can go for the left, or if you if you are stuck with the right radial only, in that case, for me, uh, with this long experience, I can tell that the five French XB catheter, extra backup catheter, five French extra backup catheter for angiographic purpose, it's a, like a like a catheter for left system is possible with any loops. Obviously, O3-5 wire support should be needed all the time. Otherwise, the kinking would be there. Otherwise, five French uh, XB guide catheter, you can engage in the left system because the problem with, usually happens with the left system engagement. And then the right system also with the JR catheter, any sort of French. Usually, I take the French guide catheter rather than a diagnostic French catheter uh, for engagement in this sort of uh, like uh, you know heinous loops uh, where you will have to handle in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Saeed Rahman. So, due to the time factor, we'll move to the next lecture, and uh, we'll once again convey our appreciation to Dr. Saeed Rahman in the usual manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the last lecture in our symposium on basic coronary intervention is on tips and tricks in minimal contrast PTCA. And we have uh, Dr. Salvatore Brugleta, who is an interventional cardiologist at the University Clinic Hospital, uh, Barcelona, Spain, holding a special BA PhD in multimodality intracoronary imaging. He's, uh, I think, one of the best persons to talk on this uh, topic. Dr. Brookleta, can you uh, hear us? Yes, I can. Can you? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Ah, perfect. Great. So uh, thanks a lot, I mean, for inviting me. Uh, to me, it's a pity to, to stay, I mean, uh, uh, abroad, so to not stay with you in uh, your beautiful island. I'm going to share my my screen. So let me know if you can if you can see. I guess you you can see the screen. I guess you can. Okay. So these are my conflict of interest for uh, for this talk. So and I would like to start with uh, by presenting you a, a typical patient that we have in uh, in uh, in our daily practice. So he is a male of uh, 79 years old, so with hypertension, dyslipidemia. Uh, he presented in our hospital for a non ST elevation MI. And as usual, so a patient for this age, so he has some renal impairment with a, a glomerular filtration rate of 40 milliliters per minute. 
So this is the anatomy of the patient. Uh, so there was a, a previous stent in the proximal part of the LED. And you see that there is a, a severe stenosis in the distal part of the left main, which involves also the ostium of the LED and the, and the C-complex. So this is a patient uh, where uh, the use of a minimal contrast PCI may be an advantage. So not only for the age, but also for the renal impairment that the patient has as baseline. And uh, due to the anatomy, maybe many of us, so we don't think about this uh, minimal uh, contrast PCI, but it is something that uh, very easy to do. And uh, so it will be bene beneficial for the patient. What is the definition of minimal contrast PCI? So minimal contrast PCI, so is it just to give the minimal contrast as possible to the patient for making the uh, percutaneous coronary intervention in order to uh, avoid the so-called induced uh, kidney injury. So the kidney injury, which is uh, following the uh, administration of contrast, is not only I mean, in the 48 hours following the contrast administration, but it can be available also so within seven days. So it's not something that maybe we see immediately after the intervention, but we need also to wait seven days for uh, excluding it. So that is um, something very important uh, for the prognosis of the patient because as you may see here, every time that we have uh, a, a, kidney, a chronic kidney disease that contrast induce uh, a kidney injury, so we increase the net adverse clinical events in our patient as you may see here, as compared to patients that we, without I mean, any of these two um, uh, outcomes. So how to do it? So the use of minimal contrast PCI to me starts before the, the PCI. So we have to start addressing the patient. And for this reason, I would recommend you, so not only to look at the ejection fraction of the patient, but specifically to the left ventricular uh, and the astolic pressure of, uh, of the patient. There is a, a very good study which was published many years ago in The Lancet, where there was a comparison between uh, uh, the intention as a control, as we usually do, with a, a rate of one milliliters per kilogram per, minute, per, per hour, as compared to uh, left oh. ventricular and diastolic pressure guided hydration. So according to the pressure that was uh, uh, measured uh, uh, immediately before the PCI, so the hydration rate was uh, uh, higher, for example, every time that there was a, a lower uh, pressure. And this uh, so brought to a, a reduced rate of uh, maze, that MI and also need of dialysis. So that is something that we, we have to think in our patient. So to start uh, uh, as much as we can, the hydration uh, rate of uh, uh, before the PCI. Then another important uh, uh, trip to consider so for use of minimal contrast PCI before the PCI is to have a, a specific plan A, B, and C, so whatever. And also to take in mind that which is the maximum uh, volume of contrast that we need or that we should uh, amaze it to our patient. Usually take the glomerular rate filtration and we, uh, we estimate that we have to use more or less the same or even less. So in the patient, for example, I showed you at the beginning, which is uh, with a, a glomerular filtration rate of 40. So we have to uh, think about to use 40 milliliters of contrast. And for that reason, we have to think uh, our plan. So where we want to use this uh, this contrast, take into account that uh, once we finish the PCI, we needed to acquire an angel because uh, uh, we have to exclude, for example, any, any perforation. And then, so we go for the PCI. So first step is a uh, engagement and worry. So we have to do that without any contrast injection. That is quite easy. So if we select the, the good catheter, as we have heard, for example, in the first talk today, and uh, we have to aspirate every time that we engage the catheter, because sometimes there is contrast inside the catheter. We have to avoid the so-called poofs. And in case so we uh, we need a confirmation if we are engaged to the left or to the right coronary artery, we may inject saline. The saline so is giving a sort of ischemic uh, changes in the ECG, as you may see here, and that is a, a sort of an indirect confirmation that we have engaged the, the coronary artery with the, our catheter, so we don't need to inject any any contrast. Second step, so is uh, of course, so this is a ad hoc PCI. So it's not a PCI that is done during the same, I mean, uh, uh, procedure, uh, which is a diagnostic procedure. So that means that we have some uh, images acquired in the previous uh, um, coronary angiogram. So we have to uh, take them. We have to put in a second screen. So in order to uh, know so where we are. 
And we have also to minimize our views. So we have to use, for example, our scaudal cranial view for the LED of the circumflex or a cranial view, for example, for the right coronary artery. So we have to take in mind which are the views that we want to use. So without avoiding and so to move the C tube and uh, uh, to inject uh, much more contrast. So another thing which is uh, useful but is not available, unfortunately, in all the cat lab, is the so-called roadmap. So you need to just a 3cc of contrast, and then so you may have this image, so which is uh, uh, on, on the right side of your screen. And according to this, so you may guide so the wire inside your coronary artery. You may also know where the side branches uh, uh, are, are, uh, are, so you know so more or less where you are. But uh, if you don't have, I mean, this, uh, um, this in your lab, so it's also important, uh, so when you have uh, such image, so that you recognize, for example, some anatomical landmark, like, like for example, calcification, or some uh, uh, cost, disc, etc. And you have to avoid any table movements, because otherwise you move, I mean, this, uh, this landmark. The patient should be in a comfortable sedation, because also the patient with uh, some movements, so may change your anatomical landmarks. And then, so the most important uh, to me step for the minimal contrast PCI is uh, the use of IVOS, which uh, to me should be extensive. So how to use the intracoronal imaging? So um, first for planning PCI, so once you have engaged your cladding catheter, you have crossed the lesion with the wire. So you have to do so IVOS in order to understand the, which is the plaque composition that you want to treat. So if there is calcium or not, and then so to choose also the stent size in terms of diameters and length. And once you have done the PCI, instead of again to inject contrast, you have to do again the IBUS in order to understand if there is uh, some standard under, under expansion, so stand malposition, or if there is a resection, for example, as a stent edge, which needs to be covered with a, an additional stent. For planning PCI, so it is important to recognize the composition of the plaque. So always take in mind, so if you have a soft plaque, mixed plaque or calcified plaque, because the calcified plaque needs more attention from you. So with the use of non-compliant balloon or in some case of the lithotripsy or for example, rotablator. In case you are treating a calcified plaque and you want to be sure that your plaque has been uh, correctly tackled, so you, have, uh, you may do another high boost after the uh, plaque preparation. And you may see, I mean, some uh, uh, fracture of the calcium, which is um, a sign that you have done your, your preparation correctly. So you may do, uh, uh, you may go for the following step, which will be, so for example, the, the stent uh, implantation. And for the stent implantation, so that is also an information that you may take from the IVOS pre, uh, PCI. So you have to take, I mean, three different uh, uh, points on the angel that you have, for example, in, uh, in your mind and on the IVOS, which is the proximal and uh, the distal uh, landing zone at the, minimum, the uh, site of the minimum lumen area. So here, I mean, the distance between the A and C, so between the, the two lane, the, um, landing zone, so it's the length of the stent that you have to take. And then for the, for the stent uh, uh, diameters, you have to take the distal uh, site, so the distal uh, part of the landing zone. So you have to choose uh, uh, your stent according to this distal part. Here, an important thing that you have to take into account is, uh, for example, if you, you are treating or not a bifurcation, because with the bifurcation, so you are dealing with three different diameters for the main branch, the, the proximal distal part, and for the side branch. So if you select the stent according to the distal part of the main branch, so uh, consider to use a, a non-compliant balloon in order to expand the proximal part of the stent according to the diameters of the proximal main uh, vessel. So that is an information which is quite easily, I mean, to take from your uh, IVOS pullback uh, before the PCI. And that is also an important information when you choose the balloon, when you sorry, when you choose the stent, because so the stent has a, a limit expansion, so which is a, a different according to the platform that we use. So if, for example, the distal part of the uh, of your vessel is uh, sizing a 2.5 and the proximal part is sizing a 3.5, you have to take a stent according to this different expansion uh, limit. 
So once you have used your imaging uh, also for post PCI, so you are pretty sure that you are doing something good for the patient, because as you see in this study, so the target vessel failure. So if you use IVOS uh, uh, as compared to angiography, so it's dramatically reduced by use of uh, IVOS, especially in patients with a chronic kidney disease. You see that there is a, a 30% reduction. So in, uh, in, uh, in the rate of target vessel failure. So if we come back to our case, so if you remember, I mean, this anatomy. So what we did, so was just to put two wires and to perform an IVOS pullback. So you may see here, so we may scroll, I mean, this IVOS pullback, you see that there is a, a calcified plaque. So in my practice, what I usually do is just to go first uh, where the lesion is located. So the lesion here is located in this part. Also in this case, it's very useful where you have a wire coming from the circumflex because uh, in the IVOS you recognize where the circumflex and the provocation is. And then, so according to this pullback, so you see that there is a calcified plaque, you select the proximate, the distal uh, landing zone, and then you go for the uh, for the circumflex pullback as well. And here, so it is important in this specific case, so to, to know in advance, so if you are going to use a, a one stand technique or two stand technique. So let's go, uh, let's scroll, I mean, this pullback up to the, uh, Hostel part of the circumflex, where is, which is located here. So you see that there was a severe stenosis uh, with some calcification. And then so we open to the uh, left main. So according to this, so we selected our strategy, so which was a two stand technique with uh, uh, some preparation of the lesion with a non compliant balloon. And we decided also up front of the stand sizing for the uh, LED left main, and then for the circumflex. So we selected a TO no compliant balloon for the lighting the uh, LED, and for the lighting as well, the circumflex ostium. And then, so we went uh, with a stent here. So you needed to inject some contrast because uh, you needed to know, so if the stent is uh, uh, good located. And once you have implanted, you know already by IVOS uh, analysis that you have done before, which is the, the size of the balloon for making an, uh, a pot. And then, so you, you follow your plan. So you go for a, a tap in this case with a two stent technique with a, a 315 uh, stent on the circumflex. And then, so final kissing, a final pot. So I will uh, skip, I mean, this uh, IVOS after. So, because I want to show you this. So after, once you have done your PCI, you have implanted your stent. So you have to go again with the pullback of the IVOS, uh, uh, either in the LID or in the circumflex in this case. And the most important thing that you have to achieve is the ratio between the minimum stent area and the average reference lumen, which should be at least 80%. If you reach, I mean, this uh, threshold, so you are quite uh, happy. Otherwise, you have to uh, perform no compliant balloon dilatation again. And that is the final result that you need, uh, of course, some contrasts. So in order to exclude that you have done some perforation on uh, on your uh, during your PCI. So in this specific case, I mean, uh, you don't need any contrast for uh, catheter engagement, for passage of wire, for IVOS. You just need some contrast for stand positioning and for final angiography. So you may end up this PCI with just six milliliters of contrast. So to recap, I mean, my presentation. So I would like, I mean, you to keep in mind that minimal contrast PCI is something that should be applied in, in all your patients which are, which are high risk of contrast induced uh, acute kidney injury. Hydratation is very important. So keep in mind that the uh, use not of the ejection fraction, but of the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. Use of previously acquired images. So coming from your site or from other site, if for example, the patient is referred from another hospital. The use of anatomical landmarks, like for example, calcium on the coronary arteries, which can give you some information where, for example, bifurcation are located. And the last but not the least, so please use uh, extensively, so IVOS, in order to uh, make a plan of your PCI and to be sure that you have done a proper PCI. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salvatore, for your excellent lecture. And thank you very much for delivering the lecture online for us. I know this is very early hours for you.
And due to the uh, limitation of the time, actually we have to wind up the first symposium on uh, basics of uh, coronary interventions. And uh, uh, let us uh, uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Salvatore in our usual manner once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank our chairpersons and uh, I would like to introduce the next lecture, which would be the place of imaging and physiological assessment during complex coronary PCI. Uh, so this lecture will be delivered by Dr. Gunasekaran, and I would like to invite two consultant cardiologists to chair this session. So if Dr. Ajit Vanyarachi and Dr. Amila Valawath could please come in as chairs. Thank you. Uh, so the next lecture is... Uh going to be on the place of imaging and physiological assessment uh, during complex uh, coronary interventions. Uh, will be delivered by Dr. Sengot Tuvelu Gunasekaran, who's a senior cardiologist and an interventionalist um, at Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. He's currently the course director of India Vals organization, founder director of imaging and physiology council of India, course co-director of Asia PCR Singapore, Program Committee Member, PCR Tokyo, VALS, Japan, and Program Committee Member, Euro PCR 2019. His work has been published in world-renowned journals, including the Journal of American College of Cardiology and European Heart Journal. Uh, so we'll move on to the lecture by Dr. Gunasekaran. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a privilege uh, to be part of the meeting in Sri Lanka. So today, my topic would be use of imaging and physiology in complex interventions. So intracoronary imaging and physiology, uh, it's uh, very vital to have uh, these uh, imaging and physiology modalities in the cath lab. Uh, why? Because uh, it can simplify uh, PCI. You know, we know we can make more complex uh, anatomical subsets into more simplified ways to treat uh, the most significant lesions, as well as it's, uh, we know it's a very optimal tool uh, for uh, even uh, diagnosing the significant lesions as well as optimization. I think we have a lot of evidence now for PC optimization and, and identify treat complications and uh, also to improve long-term outcomes. So let me start with the different subsets of lesions. In left main lesions, uh, we know that physiology does have a, an important role. Uh, for isolated left main, it's quite easy to perform uh, uh, the uh, FFR, which can be the, either the LED or the circumflex. And if it is significant, uh, more than 0.8, uh, it gets non-significant. And also, we should know the pitfalls. Uh, if you have multiple tandem lesions, uh, we should be aware that we should use the other vessel, for example, the circumflex, uh, to assess the FFR. And uh, also, it is in unreliable when you have uh, uh, collaterals uh, of uh, other artery, for example, the right coronary CTO, which is also supplied by the left system, uh, which usually indicates that the, the territory of supply is larger and it can be falsely positive. So uh, looking at the significance of the left main, I uh, can also use imaging. And uh, uh, particularly in this uh, area, IOS has quite been shown to be uh, very useful. For example, uh, somewhat particularly in Asians, if the MLA of the left main is more than 6 millimeters, it can be left with medical management. And if the MLA is less than 4.5, it is significant and is very well correlated with the FFR and needs uh, revascularization. In a borderline IVS MLA of 4.5 to 6, uh, it is, of course, uh, can consider using an FFR, uh, which is very useful. And FFR is uh, if, uh, less than 0.8, it's considered significant. And showing an example, uh, this is a, a patient who had come with a, 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 a discomfort and shows LBBB on ECG. Our CT angio shows some uh, minimal disease in the left main and some lesions in the LAD. Our nuclear perfusion scan shows ischemic perfusion defects in the right coronary artery territory. So looking at that, uh, uh, also the CT showed a moderate lesion in the right coronary artery. So based on that, he was uh, planned for a PCI to RCA. However, an angiogram was done. You can see that uh, there is, uh, uh, if you carefully look at it, uh, though it doesn't appear to have any significant lesions in the left system, uh, the left the left main appears to be slightly smaller compared to the LAD. So it's, it's, we have to make sure that, that we are not miss out any of the uh, left coronary lesion. And also there is some damping of the catheter. So he was subjected to FFR, uh, which showed a significant disease uh, in the left main with an FFR of 0.77, both in the circumflex and the LAD. 
So which shows that the left main is significant and the right coronary artery FFR of 0.82, which again shows it's not significant. And uh, you can see that uh, the IVS uh, also confirms that the, the minimal lumen area in the left main, you can see that eccentric lesion is uh, 4.2 square millimeters. And as I mentioned, less than 4.5 is significant. And uh, hence, uh, this patient was uh, planned for a, a PCI to left main. The other important area of imaging is uh, for image optimization, particularly in left main, where one can look at uh, uh, any stent deformation, as well as to understand the remala position and, and adequate expansion, and whether we have covered the stent age uh, and uh, covered the entire left main, and uh, uh, there's no geographical miss, as well as to look at the edges of the stent. So it, it's very, we have good criteria when you have at least uh, uh, more than 90% of the distal reference size as a, as a minimal stent area. So uh, also we know that uh, there is a lot of evidence now to say that the post-PCI MLA, the IOS uh, should be uh, at least about six in the circumflex, seven square millimeters in the LAD and 10 square millimeters in the left main, which is the new criteria, particularly in large build patients uh, though the earlier criteria of 5, 6, 7, 8 is not commonly used at, uh, nowadays. So uh, there also is an example where this is a patient who had come with a, uh, acute coronary syndrome, a young patient with LV dysfunction, critical triple vessel disease with left main and distal diffuse disease and a CTO of the circumflex uh, multiple OM branches. So he had an impella-assisted PCI uh, mm -hmm. with uh, multiple stents to memory LED, distal LED, OM, and also, finally, uh, left main uh, bifurcation stenting, uh, which was done. And, and you can see the left main post-PCI. And here we could see the area, which you can see in the ostium of the LED, it's 10.06. Uh, it's, uh, and the distal LED is 3.4. And, and proximal mid LED is 9.7 square millimeters. And the ostium left main, uh, we have an area of 19.96. And the, and the mid uh, left main, it is in the 14.89, which clearly shows we've achieved a very adequate MSAs, uh, which gives very good long-term results. So HDIOS is again a very useful imaging modality to assess uh, post-optimization after left main stenting. Now moving to acute coronary syndromes, again in acute coronary syndrome, we know we should identify the culprit lesion uh, correctly and sometimes angiography may not show the correct culprit lesion and hence imaging uh, is very useful, particularly the OCT helps to delineate the culprit lesion and hence guide therapy. Also identify spontaneous coronary dissection. Also one should consider imaging when there is uh, no evidence of significant coronary disease by angiography in order to characterize the amino car. So let me show you an example. This is a young man with no risk factors, comes with anterior wall MI of two hours duration. And we can see here that the, the left, uh, left main appears normal, circumflex is normal. The LED has a, a thrombus in the proximal portion. You can see the thrombus, which is, uh, there's no flow limitation. Flow is good, but the huge uh, chunk of thrombus in the proximal LED. So this patient was subjected to OCT. OCT is very helpful. You can see the distal as it was normal. Now you can have the diseased vessel. You can see a fibrotic plaque, uh, some amount of lipid containing plaque. And uh, now the vessel appears normal here with three layers. Again, you see a atherosclerotic block with the fibro fatty block. And you can see this is a typical block erosion with thrombus uh, protruding from the arterial wall to the lumen. So this is a typical of a block erosion causing acute coronary syndrome in a young male where we don't see uh, any lesion. So this patient was just treated pharmacologically with the, uh, with 2B3, glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors and medication. He did extremely well and uh, he did not receive a stent. Uh, so next, moving on to bifurcation lesion. Uh, again, we know the importance of imaging in uh, uh, by complex bifurcations. It helps uh, both IVS and OCT will be helpful. Uh, and OCT is particularly more useful in bifurcation lesions because we can assess not only the plaque amount distribution, and also it helps to uh, identify the wire position whether we are caused through the distal strut or the proximal strut. And we know that in a, uh, in a provisional stenting, uh, distal crossing is more important. And uh, it, the OCT really helps, uh, 3D OCT really helps to un understand where the wire is and achieve optimal wire crossing. Also in uh, abdominal wire crossing, uh, we can identify the wire goes beneath the stent. One can identify and uh, do a proper wiring based on the OCT. And uh, similarly, FFR does have a role uh, in assessment of side branch. Uh, when we have a, a doubt, we don't have to unnecessarily put another stent in the side branch. 
Uh, there is also a lot of data now, particularly in the left main uh, bifurcation stenting. One can look at the, the catena and look at the stent configuration, the ostium or the circumflex. This is a stent crossover strength from left main to LED. And one can look at the circumflex ostium, which is covered by the strength straps. Whether it's a link-free type, which means there is no link in the in in the in the ostia of the corner, the circumflex artery, or a link connecting type where you have a link which is present, uh, and also uh, there is no jailing at all, then you don't have to do anything. So if it's a link-free type, it's quite easy to do a, a kissing balloon, and then you can make sure the struts are taken away. Whereas in a link connecting type, it's sometimes difficult to remove the link connection and may require an aggressive pot followed by aggressive kissing balloon, or sometimes even a push balloon technique to push the struts of the stent. So this is again very useful uh, by uh, OCT to identify the pattern of a strut in the ostium of the uh, uh, circumflex in a left main PCI. So similarly also can, one can look at the, uh, the risk of a side branch occlusion. Like for example, this uh, patient who has uh, the long tune image, you can see a spiky carina, which means carina is pointing towards the side branch and this predisposes to side branch occlusion as you can see in this uh, angiography. The patient after stenting the across the side branch has lost the side branch because the carina has shifted because of spiky carina. So this, all these can be identified based on OCT. Another important uh, uh, identification is to look at the calcium calcified block or a calcific nodule opposite side branch. If we have a nodule opposite the side branch, uh, when we do PCI, uh, we may not yield to the lesion and then the stent uh, uh, may not uh, expand in the other direction and expand in the opposite direction and ends cause a carina shift and occlusion of the side branch. And this, if we identify the calcified block by imaging, one can either use a debulking uh, and uh, make sure the calcified block is properly addressed uh, before we stent so that we can avoid uh, a shift of the carina and loss of side branch. So this is an example where this is a patient where you can see that there is a heavy calcium uh, and the LED just opposite to the circum diagonal ostium. You can see that there is heavy calcium. And once we debulk and then put a stent, uh, the stent expands well and uh, you, uh, there is uh, uh, there is no closure of the side branch, even though there is mild pinching, uh, one trend closure. So it's important to understand and debulk the uh, proximus main vessel before sending the side branch. Let me show an example of how, how OCT is very useful in uh, sizing. And this is LED diagonal bifurcation. One has to look at the distal size based on the OCT. It looks like there's a loss. Uh, cross uh, disparity in the sizes of the proximal and the distal LED after the diagonal. Uh, diagonal appears to be a significant uh, size, uh, almost quite uh, bigger than the L distal LED. It's important that this bifurcation be treated uh, properly with imaging. So we have done uh, we have done an, uh, uh, a stenting and a kissing balloon, and we want to see the OCT uh, where we can see the OCT the, after pre dilatation. Uh, we can see the OCT the sizes of the distal uh, proximal LED as well as the distal LED, the plot characteristics and uh, understand the carina and the length of the stent. Everything can be done by OCT and followed by that. We do a, a, a stenting and then the kissing balloon and the, uh, the pot and the kissing balloon. And finally, you have this uh, result with a good uh, uh, opposition of the stent proximal and distal. There's smile pinching of the diagonal, though the diagonal is very big. We can see that we do an FFR and see that the FFR is 0.89, which is clearly not significant and unnecessary treatment of diagonal is avoided. And uh, this is post uh, uh, stenting OCT, where you can see that uh, you, you, you can see that the diagonal is patent and you can see that there's some deformation opposite at the carina, which should be corrected uh, with the pot in the proximal optimization, where you can make sure we have a final pot helps to achieve a good result in the bifurcation. And we can also see that the stent opposition is quite well. There is no edge dissection, uh, both in the proximal and distal. Uh, and you can also see the stent uh, footprints are much lower in the upper branch due to post dilatation and the pot. So calcified lesions, again, we know imaging is critical. If you look at uh, the, 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 the lesion approach, uh, if you have moderate calcium, again, imaging and severe calcium, it's also imaging as a first option to understand the lesion and then treat appropriately. So there is several scores, and this is a calcium score based on OCT, which is very widely accepted. So if you have a calcium arc, which is uh, more than 50 degree arc, uh, or if you have, which is more than 180, is, uh, is, that is two points, and the thickness of the calcium, again, which is very exclusive to OCT, uh, it cannot be seen in IVS. Again, the calcium thickness is more than 0.5 millimeters, it's one point, and the lesion length more than five millimeters, one point. So uh, based on this, if the patient has 
significant calcium they will need a therectomy uh, before stenting and similarly in ios it's got a, a calcium score where, which is uh, based on the calcium arc uh, as well as the 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 presence of calcific nodule and uh, the presence of the vessel diameter whether it is small or large so based on that if the calcium score is more than 1 then we should consider a threctomy so this is a case example of a elderly man who has got a calcified lesion you can see the heavy calcium uh, in the proximal mid led as well as uh, there is a significant lesion in the circumflex as you can see and the right contour has got some minimal disease so he was uh, uh, taken for pci to the led uh, oct catheter uh, could cross that's the first option but hence an nc balloon crosses but uh, there is a significant waste uh, so we try to use an ivl ivl balloon does not go through so rotational arthrectomy was done with a 1.5 mm burr and then uh, followed by that we do imaging and uh, look if you look at the oct uh, of the uh, rotational arthrectomy they uh, you can see the rota cuts made by rota burr uh, which is clearly evident uh, in the oct and the OC, oct also shows heavy calcium you can see the circumferential calcium uh, which is heav- heavy and and almost thickness is more than 1000 microns here you can see a heavy 360 degree heavy calcium so it's a quite a large segment of calcium uh, more than uh, 20 mm with a large calcium burden so this is clearly a high calcium score uh, and this patient as you can see in the still image uh, the the dense uh, calcium which is uh, quite circumferential the score of four of more than four so then uh, followed by rotablation a shock wave uh, lithotripsy was done with a 3 into 12 mm ivl balloon which you can see the waste of the shock wave balloon disappears as the shock is being delivered and uh, this helps to treat the the dense deep, deeper calcium compared to the proximal calcium which is treated by rot ablation this post uh, uh, calcium uh, and post ibl imaging we can see that there are a lot of facts of fractures uh, caused by the ibl uh, which is even extending up to the uh, deeper layers of calcium so by using both the rot ablation and ibl uh, we can see that the nice fractures uh, which we have achieved Uh, using these two modalities and uh, this uh, has really helped uh, to uh, to fracture this calcium which can very well be appreciated uh, with uh, uh, with oct and also 3d oct and followed by uh, stenting uh, with a with a long stent in the led and opn balloon this is a final result we can see the stent has expanded nicely uh, with almost 100% expansion and with good edges so which can be very well appreciated with oct Uh, we cannot uh, have achieved this kind of a result uh, uh, w- without the ocd guidance and appropriate uh, debulking with the rota tripsy uh, so this is the final angiographic result with a good uh, uh, position and a good result uh, with the stent uh, stenting so uh, now also imaging is extremely useful in uh, cases of stent failure uh, this uh, again is one of the very important uh, class 2a indication uh, both in patients with uh, uh, stent uh, thrombosis as well as uh, instant restenosis so one can look at the cause of uh, uh, restenosis and failure in this example where we can look at uh, whether there is a neoantimal hyperplasia or is there a neoatherosclerosis or is there a under expansion which is again very very important cause a treatable cause of uh, stent failure again uh, this can uh, sometimes result in uh, stent uh, thrombosis uh, again it to understand the mechanism of stent failure and then treat appropriately will help uh, to uh, avoid re restenosis and uh, good long term results so this is an example of a patient who had a, a, a 60 year old male who had circumflex pci uh, with nstemi and they had come with the stent thrombosis and we could see that by imaging we could see that stent was grossly malaposed and there is a significant amount of thrombus uh, which is formed around the stent and you could see thrombus extending down and it's the cause of stent thrombosis here we just did a plain balloon dilatation to adequately expand the stent and making sure we have achieved a, a good uh, position uh, without any further need for uh, additional stent so it's important to understand the cause the mechanical problem and correct it and if you identify a biological problem uh, in uh, instant restenosis one can accordingly treat this patient was treated as you can see uh, with a good expansion and uh, now uh, the the under expansion again is one of the most important causes of uh, instant restenosis and as you can see this is this is a uh, patient who has come with the uh, uh, new intimal hyperplasia so when you with the old stent under expansion should be assessed and appropriately expanded Uh, so that this again is a very treatable cause 
for strength failure if there are multiple strengths again we should know that it's uh, important to understand the uh, 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 to uh, properly uh, dilate it rather than putting a uh, partial layers of strength and giving a final uh, good mlas and good expansion of the strength so for now moving to multi vessel disease again imaging and physiology is extremely useful such as in this example you have multiple lesions in all the three vessels but if you think uh, that the lesions uh, are uh, and significant and uh, uh, in uh, based on angiography sometimes we completely wrong as you can see here the uh, the rca lesion appears not to be significant whereas the lady lesion appears to be more significant so appropriately uh, we can treat using physiology uh, and uh, also in multiple complex lesions uh, like in serial lesions one can identify by mapping physiologically identify the the lesion which is significant and treat only that lesion so that we can reduce the number of stents for example the the if you look at the full back uh, of using an ffr or an rfr or ifr here you can see that in a diffuse disease you will have a pattern of gradual slope of the curve whereas here there will be a sudden step up which indicates a focal lesion which needs to be treated by a stent whereas a diffuse lesion there is no clear indication for a stent and these patients should not improve with stenting and if it is significant we need to think of uh, other maladies or use uh, uh, biopsy ca cavage so in this uh, example uh, we have a patient who has a elderly lady who has got multiple lesions in the lady you could see that the lady ostium is uh, calcified and diseased so the left main appears normal there is no landing zone in the left main and you have a mid lady lesion almost distal lesion so if we had to there is a circumflex uh, ostial lesion uh, also the lesion in the uh, om uh, and, the, and the proximal circumflex so based on this angiography he would, the patient would need multiple stents in the circumflex om starting from the left main to lad mid lad and up to the distal lad so this patient is subjected to uh, subjected to ffr uh, otherwise uh, the stent length would be very long if you look at the lad and the om so we decided to do a ffr guidance and we do do ffr the ffr to om and the circumflex is normal this is rfr for an, o, o, both f and rfr were done so rfr clearly shows uh, which is the om and the circumflex lesions are not significant now to the lad the lad lesion is very significant rfr of 0.62 we know the cutoff value for rfr is 0.89 and this means that the lad the entire lad and the left main is significant so how do we identify the multiple lesions is the ostial lad significant the distal lesion do rfr pull back and r for pull back is extremely useful here you can see these lesions lesion number 1 2 3 and the four is ostial lesion now as we move uh, from the the r of r from distal to proximal in a, in a pull back uh, we can see that the lesion is a step up from well, the step up is highest in the lesion 1 and lesion 2 and there is a step up is small in lesion 4 so what we need to do is to take the pressure from uh, the present uh, r of r of uh, uh, 0.62 is a baseline 0.62 we want to take it to uh, to next level which is up to the lesion where we can achieve an rfr of 0.95 which means the first lesion of number lesion number 4 need not be treated so if we address the distal the proximal distal and the mid lesion that is lesion number 1 2 and 3 we can achieve an rfr of 0.95 which is more than enough to avoid the treating the the ostial lad lesion based on the rfr uh, so exactly based on this Uh, we did treat uh, with just one stent for mid and distal lad and we avoided we had a landing zone we I, I avoided the distal lad which uh, and the and the left main and the post pc rfr was 0.98 so clearly we were able to establish good flow and a good uh, post pc rfr with just one stent uh, leaving no stents to the left main lad or the circumflex which clearly simplified uh, the uh, the pci in this complex uh, multiple uh, lesions again another uh, important uh, investigation is using prior registration uh, with using both ios and ifr uh, this is again uh, uh, we can uh, this is a lesion where you have a bifurcation lesion with a long lesion the lad uh, proximal to the diagonal and distal to the diagonal you can see there is a long lesion one can identify which is significant whether to treat the entire lad or only the proximal lad and also using ios uh, uh, core registration as well as the ffr ifr core registration one can identify exactly uh, the site of the lesion and the significance of each part of the lesion this i i was pull back and uh, we can also do a, a ffr ifr where you can see the ifr was uh, uh, 0.77 distally which is quite significant and uh, if we decide to treat 
the, the entire segment of the vessel here, you can see these are the points where you have the highest drop in pressure. And if you're able to treat the entire vessel up to the distal edge, we can estimate that IFR is 0.95, whereas we treat only the proximal lesion, we will not be able to achieve a good IFR. So based on that, we decided to put a long stem from the proximal to the distal LED. And this is post PCI. Uh, we do a IOS a pullback, and uh, then we can also do an IFR uh, which shows a signal normal 0.95 IFR. So clearly using a core registration with simultaneous registration of IOS and IFR, one can identify and also predict the post-PCI FFR. Uh, depending on that, we can extend that particular lesion. So post-PCI FFR is again an important uh, imaging modality, uh, which we can help us to, uh, uh, to know that the long-term results will be good and uh, it's optimal to achieve at least a post-PCI FFR of uh, about 0.94. And uh, based on that, one can decide to do uh, adequate post elevation and even imaging to make sure we achieve a good optimization uh, post-PCI. So coming to the next subset of patients with the uh, CTO, again, uh, IOS is extremely useful here, uh, uh, particularly in, uh, in if you have an osteal uh, occlusion of LED, for example, one can use IOS into the circumflex and guide uh, uh, wiring of the CTO of the osteal LED with IOS. So it's also useful in reverse cut or even in uh, uh, anti-grade dissection re-entry uh, when the you no know, injections can be given. And IOS can facilitate entry into the true lumen uh, if, uh, when we may cross uh, the CTO lesions. And particularly, IOS is also useful in PC optimization and management of complications during PCI. This is one of our examples where you have a, 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 a total occlusion CTO of the LAD, uh, sorry, CTO of the RCA, where we get trying to open it with the anti-grade approach and we are not able to cross and then we use an IOS and we find that the, the, the we have gone through the false lumen. Uh, if you can see here, this is a true lumen proximal cap we cross and gone to the uh, false lumen. You can see the true lumen uh, compressed here and you can see the true lumen. This is the true lumen. And uh, now, uh, again, uh, now what we do is we use a Gaia 2 wire, we remove in a fine cross, and we reintroduce the wire into the true lumen. And uh, here we, can, we have crossed. This is a part where we cross from the false lumen uh, to the true lumen, and then we go into the distal uh, uh, true lumen, and then we put uh, uh, and also identify the true reference diameter in the proximal segment, the distal segment, and the landing zone, depending on that. A diameter and the length of the stent is selected based on the IOS and we're able to, so two stents were placed overlapping fashion. This is the final result and IOS really helped in this case to get into the true lumen. So finally, uh, to summarize, uh, in the imaging is very critically useful in cath lab, particularly in complex lesions, uh, not only in diagnosis, but also in uh, uh, patients where who have uh, guidance and PCI optimization and call comp complex PCI, including uh, left main calcified lesions, bifurcation PCI, long lesions, multiple multiple lesions as well as multivessel PCI, and in CTOs. It's also helpful in uh, stent failure, both in stent thrombosis and uh, uh, ISR. It's useful in a diagnostic, uh, uh, particularly in left main. And also imaging is uh, very useful to assess uh, uh, any ambiguous lesions or a borderline lesion. And uh, it can help to reduce the syntax score. So complex lesions can be more made more simple. We know that the syntax score uh, after using FR can be brought down by, by making it as a functional syntax score, thereby reducing the number of vessels to be treated. And uh, in, in patients uh, post-PCI, uh, FFR is again very useful to, uh, uh, to understand that we have achieved a good result as well as to give an excellent long-term results. So uh, with an increasing complexity of uh, both uh, anatomy as well as patient comorbidities, uh, the role of imaging and physiology to guide PCI has become critically important to improve overall long-term outcomes and will definitely continue to grow. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sengutviru, uh, for giving a very comprehensive talk on coronary imaging and physiology, how to use them uh, in appropriate patients. It was very, very uh, excellent lecture. So uh, due to interest of time, we, we are not able to allow questions. So we have to move to the next uh, uh, program. Uh, so thank you so much. Shall we again appreciate his uh, work uh, as usual manner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ajit and Amila. Uh, I would like to make a short announcement because the, uh, we are actually running behind time. Uh, tea will be ready outside. Actually, it is in fact ready now. And we would like it if you could just go out in batches and enjoy your tea. But we are proceeding with the conference as scheduled. So our next uh, symposium would be on uh, a percutaneous replacement of the aortic valve. And I would like to invite the following consultant cardiologists to chair this session. So I'd like to invite Dr. Sepali Mendis, Dr. Pandu Lathaudarachi, Dr. K. Sundareshan, and Dr. M. H. M. Zaki to chair this session. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the, the TAVI session of the Sri Lanka College of Cardiology. We have an uh, eminent uh, uh, panel you know, here, uh, chairpersons in the, the gathering here. Um, and we've got a lineup of three uh, distinguished uh, um, speakers, uh, two giants, and an emerging uh, consultant cardiologist uh, from uh, uh, Australia. Uh, so, in the interest of time, we should, uh, you know, proceed uh, with the, the, the talks. And so, uh, to introduce the first speaker, I would pass it on to Dr. Sepalika Mendis to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Chenna Naikara. Okay. The first lecture is on patient selection and assessment of TAVI by Dr. Chenna Naikara. Uh, he is an eminent young cardiologist with expertise in heart failure, intervention, and artificial intelligence. He is currently serving as a an interventional and structural cardiologist in Melbourne, Australia. His PhD based on cardiovascular hemodynamics and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which was awarded in 2019. He has been a speaker, presented research cases in many interventional symposia, including ESC and ACC. Over to you, Dr. Shane Nanakara. Hello, everyone. How are you? Uh, nice to see you all. I believe you have a pre recorded talk there to play just so that the internet doesn't cause an issue. Is Hello right? everyone, my name is Shane Naniakara and thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm one of the interventional and structural cardiologists at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. I had the pleasure of working with Ajith a few years ago when he was down here in Australia and it's a pleasure to chat to you all. Today we're going to be talking about patient selection and assessment the transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And after the talk, I'll be around to answer some questions. So let's start by talking about patient selection. And what I want to focus on here is the changing risk categories. One of the key differences that we've seen with TAVI over this last decade is we used to do it in extreme risk patients, people who are not suitable for open heart surgery, and then we did it in people who are high risk, then medium risk, and now it's essentially open to patients of all risk groups. But the challenge is then, how do we choose who is suitable for surgical aortic valve replacement versus transcatheter? This guideline from the American group in 2020 talks about the management of patients with valvular heart disease. There is a similar guideline, although not the same, from the European group. But this one here does break things down reasonably well. Let's zoom in on this a little bit. So we take our patient with aortic stenosis. And the key part highlighted in green there is that we involve a heart valve team. I'll talk about that more in a moment. We assess their risk for surgery. And we can do this with typical scores, something like the STS score which is essentially a score that allows you to lay out the patient's comorbidities and then highlight if they have uh, certain conditions that make them at prohibitive risk for surgery. We can also measure frailty, and this is critical. It can be done with simplistic measures like the clinical frailty score, or we can do more complex measures, walking them up a corridor, for example, for a six minute walk test, or what's called the get up and go test. Then we look at the patient's age group. Younger patients, those under the age of 50, should be still considered for a mechanical aortic valve replacement or a ROS procedure. Patients who are in that age group of 50 to 65, that gets harder and often the discussion is around surgical aortic valve replacement and either a mechanical or a bioprosthetic valve. 
Once patients are over the age of 65, they are really considered suitable for a bioprosthetic valve. And then the decision is, if a patient is going to have a bioprosthetic valve, it can be done either via surgery or the transcatheter approach. And so we can break them into a few groups. People who are under 65, maybe surgery. People who are over 80, more likely to have TAVI. And then people who are between 65 and 80, really either one is suitable. And this depends on their valve factors and vascular factors. This group here, the 65 to 80 year old group, this is one to focus on with the heart team. Now the heart team is a critical approach that's been taken with TAVI right from the beginning. And it consists of a few people. We have a cardiologist, typically the structural cardiologist who has received the referral for the patient and has reviewed them and arranged their workup. We have a cardiac surgeon, typically somebody who would be performing the aortic valve replacement if they are deemed suitable for that. We have a non-TAVI cardiologist. This may be an imaging or a uh, interventional cardiologist, or but can also be a heart failure or electrophysiologist. Somebody without that bias or vested interest in TAVI, but still with the cardiac perspective. And then we have a non-cardiologist, someone who can act as a patient advocate outside the cardiac space, and someone who is taking into account those other comorbidities and also highlighting their peri uh, operative risk when it comes to anesthesia. That may be the anaesthetist or a general physician. In certain places, it is an intensive care physician. We also have our structural heart coordinator. Some places call this person a valve clinic coordinator, the person who's managing the list. And of course, our research team, a lot of these patients are involved in various research trials, particularly here at the Alfred. Now, when it comes to assessment, there are three tests that we assess every patient on. Echocardiography to determine clearly the severity of the aortic stenosis and their ventricular function. Coronary angiography to evaluate for concomitant coronary disease. And perhaps most importantly, and the real game changer over the last decade, has been commuted, computed tomography. You can see the clarity of the pictures we can get with a good quality CT scan. This is a real patient, uh, and you can see the images of their aortic valve in both 3D on the left and then two two-dimensional cuts. And what we typically do when we uh, have a patient, we get their CT scan, and now we have a 3D data set where we can cut and slice their aortic valve apparatus in different angles, we can assess where the calcium is, we can assess if it's uh, at what the height of the coronaries are, how wide the sinuses are, and what all of the other relationships are of the other intracardiac structures. Critically, we get a measurement of their aortic annulus, and we spend a lot of time calculating the area of this ellipse as well as the perimeter, because that tells us what size valve we're going to choose. This also gives us some impression of what other risks might be, the risk of coronary obstruction or difficulty with passing the valve from the peripheries up to the heart. And knowing these things can help us choose between surgery and TAVI. If someone has prohibitive vascular anatomy or they have a high risk of coronary obstruction, then we know that we should be considering that surgery may be more suitable rather than TAVI. And so when we look at their imaging, we look at these different parameters, and these are just a few. But we can look at how heavily calcified the leaflets are, how heavily calcified the left ventricular outflow tract is. We can estimate the risk of developing a conduction disturbance and a consequent pacemaker. And we can also look at other parameters, how difficult it will be to deliver the valve, how likely it will be to develop coronary obstruction. Now, a long time ago, when TAVI started, 10, 15 years ago, it was really just about looking at the dimension of the aorta and whether the valve was tricuspid or not. But now we've really branched out. CT has become of a much higher quality that allows us to measure a huge number of different parameters from both the valve perspective, 
but also looking at peripheral vascular anatomy. And these both of these factors are critical in determining if a patient is suitable for transcatheter aortic valve implantation versus the surgical approach. So how do we ultimately make the decision? What are these deciding factors? And these are just a few. Along the left, you can see parameters uh, that we use, and then uh, SAVA versus TAVI. So we talked about this 65 to 80 kind of parameter. Different papers will give you different numbers, but we tend to use this. Under 65, typically leaning towards surgery, over 80, leaning towards TAVI, and 65 to 80, using these other factors to help you decide. You, we always need to measure their surgical risk. That may be your gestalt as a clinician, or it may be more objective using parameters such as the STS score. Always try and estimate the patient's frailty, and typically we tend to use the clinical frailty score, which is a subjective assessment from the clinician about how frail that patient is. We look at the valve morphology. We know that typically TAVI is, uh, has excellent outcomes in tricuspid valves, and there is increasing data around bicuspid valves, although that's not quite there yet. We try to assess their peripheral vascular anatomy to see if they're suitable for the femoral approach. Alternate access with TAVI is possible. We can go through the inferior vena cava. We can go through the axillary or subclavian arteries, and we can go through the carotid arteries. Transapical approaches where we go through the apex of the heart through a miniature surgical procedure have fallen out of favor as the risks are significantly higher. We try to assess if the patient has other valve disease, particularly mitral regurgitation, and then determine how that is best tackled, both that as well as coronary disease. If these are present, then sometimes these patients are more suitable for surgery, although in patients with significantly high surgical risk, we can do the TAVI and then take other percutaneous approaches to the mitral or tricuspid valve, for example, with edge-to-edge -edge repair techniques. And then there are other factors. Do they have aortic disease? For example, bicuspid patients often have a dilated aorta, and that's not something we can deal with percutaneously. Do they have significant septal hypertrophy? Is there evidence of infection? And from a surgical point of view, we are less likely to want to pursue surgery if they have a porcelain aorta, if they had a previous stenotomy already, or if they've had chest irradiation. Now, one of the, the problems for us has become that as we do TAVI in lower risk patients and life expectancy increases, we need to be aware that we have to be thinking several years down the road. An average bioprosthetic valve by TAVI or surgical will last roughly 10 years. And so if we put in a valve when the patient is 65, what are we going to do when they're 75? Now we have a lot of experience with putting TAVIs inside surgical valves. And we're just coming to the point now where we've put in a few TAVIs inside a pre-existing TAVI. So finally, I might touch on how we decide what do we do. And really when it comes to setting up your own programs, we consider that the patients have three key components in their journey. There's the workup component where we're assessing them, what we've talked about today. There's our presentation at the heart team where we put all of this data together, and then there's the procedure itself. And we make sure we have a checklist-based approach, and we try and combine all of this information in a single place or in a single database. This is how we collect our data, and of course I won't go through this in exhaustive detail, but we're collecting that past history, we're looking at their bloods, their ECG, their echocardiogram, their angiogram, and their CT scan. We're measuring their risk scores in detail, and then we're making a procedure plan to make sure we're ready on the day. That's our approach to choosing patients for TAVI, uh, both in terms of how we're selecting and assessing them, and of course I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, Shane, for that uh, you know comprehensive uh, you know basic uh, lecture about you know how we choose. But uh, you know, may I just add a couple of other you know uh, points? Now, the extended uh, indication for TAVI 
came from the Popoma paper 2019. I, I guess you know, we will uh, highlight to our audience as well, uh, the um, FDA and other regulatory authorities you know, extended the, the, the usage of for low and intermediate risk uh, groups based on this uh, paper. And in fact, in Sri Lanka also, we, we use at a younger age group. And I, my, in the moment, my practice, I have a 60-year-old who had had uh, TAVI, um, you know, uh, bicuspid aortic valve. And of course, the CT uh, analysis quite is helpful in uh, bicuspid anatomies to decide where you're going to land what size because remember these anatomies are complex and then uh, the uh, uh, coronary occlusion and as well as the landing soon and valve anchoring point you, know, you really need to be carefully deciding and of course uh, valve in valve is not going to be uh, you know uh, uncommon you know in, in our setting as well you know there will be transseptal uh, approach which you know uh, Shane wasn't you know uh, didn't show us but we will have an indication there for valve in uh, mitral valve or valve in MAC those are the approaches that we might be able to use um, and of course, uh, Sri Lanka is not without aging population who are actually falling behind. Uh, so we will, you know, need uh, expansion of the services uh, without, uh, uh, you know, a doubt. Uh, so. Um, of course, uh, the, the TAVI uh, team program is very nice, of course, uh, when you have resources and uh, adequate time. You know, in Sri Lanka, of course, the other issue that we have is the number of personnel and the, the time that is taken. What is your view uh, about that, Dr. The Sepalika? National Hospital, we really had a team uh, with the cardiothoracic surgeons, you know, the anesthetic consultant anesthetists and the cardiologists and the senior registrars and the uh, rehabilitation team. Uh, before we did all our cases, the way that he said we presented uh, the cases uh, to the team and then we decided which patients to be done. Actually, we had about 10, 15 patients. We selected three after having discussions. And uh, as he said, I felt that our youngest patient was 67 years and actually he, she's doing well and better than the other. Too. Absolutely, you know, and my old, the 60-year-old, you know, is uh, now four years down the line, you know, he uh, has no paravalvular leakage. This is a supraannular valve that we had used. We also use uh, balloon expandable valves, you know, in 87-year-olds, uh, etc., you know, and then, of course, uh, they also seem to be doing very well. We even have a case where left main coronary occlusion was predicted and happened, and then we have successfully dealt with. So we do get uh, sufficient complex cases, you know, that come through, and, of course, uh, uh, it's a growing field and uh, interest. So I think, you know, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next session. Yeah. We have two giants, you know, one from down under and one from land above, you know, uh, to uh, illuminate us. Uh, so and the next speaker actually is uh, Professor Tony Walton. Unfortunately, he's on, not online. His lecture is recorded, and uh, it is on how to perform TAVI. Uh, actually, he has not sent his uh, CV to us. However, I know him that he's a consultant cardiologist interventional cardiologist in Melbourne, Australia. And I met him actually 29 years ago when I was a fellow at the Alfred. Um, he, and he just arrived from USA with a lot of skills and I can very well remember uh, he was very well respected as a young cardiologist there and he's a very skilled person. So why not we start his lecture? Yeah. Hello, my name is Tony Walton. I'm the director of the cardiac laboratories here at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you for having me present at your meeting, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. My topic today is to talk about how to do transcatheter valve implantation um, as of 2022. And there's a number of challenges which we'll discuss as we go along here. So, of course, the uh, condition that we're treating dom predominantly is aortic stenosis, which is tri-leaflet valve disease, which is stenotic in origin. But there, of course, is bicuspid valves, and more and more we're treating failed surgical valves, and we're going to see a wave of patients with failing core valves and Edwards valves who need a valve and valve tabby. So what we try to achieve, of course, is move away from this device, which is the sternotomy saw. And we want to be able to treat patients percutaneously with safe and effective options. And all of this came about, of course, after a very brave patient and doctor back in 2002 performed the first TAVI 
in Rouen um, with Alain Cribier. And this, as you know, is a successful outcome. And this laid the groundwork for us to move forwards with TAVI. Um, <clears throat> but it did take many years before it became a little bit more widespread. And it was 2008 when we started here in Australia. And even then, it was still very early days. But since that time, there's been this dramatic growth in TAVI, um, which is reflected with these volume numbers that you can see here. And this is growing extraordinarily, and it's predicted there'll be a fourfold increase over the next 10 years in TAVI volumes. So this is quite remarkable, and what started out as a fairly risky procedure has now become a widespread and widely accepted procedure as an alternative to open heart surgery for patients with aortic stenosis. A lot of this has come about because of the improving technology that we have available to us. Um, we're seeing uh, better and better valves and uh, um, the dominant valves remain the Medtronic core valve system or Evolute valve and the uh, Edwards Sapien system. There are a number of other valves on the market though. The Lotus has disappeared but there is also um, other valves such as the Portico uh, Navator system which is also getting some very good data around that. Now, all of this has come about because of this uh, improving mortality rate related to the procedure. And this is the partner one and two trials, a little bit of historical data, but you can see that we've now got mortality rates down to 1% uh, very consistently. And I think this still holds true that uh, TAVI now has become a very safe procedure and a very viable alternative to surgery. So it's fine to have good short-term results, but importantly what's going to happen to our patients uh, as the years go by and this is going to influence the way we do our procedures. So this is some data presented by Michael Reardon at ACC recently and this is the five-year incidence and outcomes and predictors of structural valve deterioration of transcatheter and surgical aortic bioprostheses and these are some insights from the core valve US Pivotal and Sir Tavi trials. So <clears throat> this is the core valve pooled analysis. This is five year um, risk for mortality. And you can see that uh, this is the surgical risk a little bit over 4% at five years. But if you look at the transcatheter valve with the Evolute system, you can see that the mortality risk was considerably less. And there was um, uh, a positive p-value with that. So this was looked to be a real finding. And then, interestingly, if you compare the smaller and larger annulus sizes, you can see here that if you look at the smaller, less than 23 millimeter annular diameters, that this uh, was more marked. And so the surgical patients did worse, and the um, self-expanding valve system did extremely well. So the risk of um, uh, cumulative incidence of structural valve deterioration was far greater with these small surgical bioprostheses as compared to the um, uh, TAVI system. If you look at this from the point of view of the larger annuluses, which were greater than 23 millimeters, then you can see that the surgical outcomes were around about 4% incidence of uh, valve deterioration and the um, um, Evolute system was a little better, not quite reaching a p-value, but nonetheless trending in the right direction. And when you look at this, is it important? Well, it, it certainly is because you can see here that um, it, uh, mortality is affected by all of this. And so um, in every case, case, in every situation here, that uh, mortality is worse if you have structural valve deterioration. So it would suggest that a balloon expandable or self-expanding rather uh, system is going to be superior to surgery in terms of this particular outcome. So our valves are getting better. We have the two dominant valves here. The um, uh, Medtronic Evolute system is steadily evolving and there's now the uh, Pro system, Pro Plus, and we're gonna see the FX system which will have um, a better delivery system and wider cells to enable better coronary access. The uh, Sapien valve is now the ultra system with a better skirt and this is also a very nice valve to be using. So I thought I'd illustrate some of the challenges that we are going to start facing and how to do these procedures using um, a valve in valve case that we did recently. 
So this is a uh, 90-year-old patient who I treated back in 2013 with a 29 millimeter core valve. He had a successful outcome and been doing very well at annual review, was now 90 years old. His last echo when I saw him as an outpatient showed that his valve was working perfectly well around about nine months before this presentation. He then came in and developed congestive heart failure over about a week with increasing shortness of breath. He was otherwise in good health for his 90 years, was still living at home, was cognitively excellent, and so we felt that he was an appropriate candidate for, to consider for a redo valve replacement with another TAVI. So he had his work up using uh, echo and tobe along with a CT and a coronary angiogram. So these are his toe results, and you can see that his left ventricular function was severely depressed, which was not in keeping with his previous study nine months earlier. His ventricle was now dilated, severely down, and there was a gradient across his valve of 23 millimeters of mercury with severe aortic regurgitation that was both valvular and paravalvular. His other valve still remained largely intact for his years. This was his um, CT workup sheet, and you can see that the uh, perimeter of this valve was around 81 millimeters, and the area was 516 millimeters squared, and the numbers on this were 24 by 27 millimeters. The LVOT was clear, and the coronaries appeared to be high enough with generous enough sinuses that the risk of coronary occlusion was likely to be low. So this is his MDT summary form that we put together. Um, his STS score was 4.3, EGFR 29, and as I mentioned, no significant frailty or cognitive issues. So we thought he was an excellent candidate for a potential TAVA in TAVI type case. And so we proceeded with that during the same hospital admission. You can see here from the transesophageal echo that the valve is in good position and there is a small uh, acceleration across the valve but it's not particularly stenotic and there is a significant leak around the valve which is better appreciated on the next slide. Now you can see here that there is a substantial paravalvular leak and that there is severe regurgitation. This is sometimes better appreciated uh, by aortogram uh, if there's any doubt as to the severity of the AR. Now, there is some paravalvular leak here, but in fact, we felt that this was predominantly due to a paravalvular leak. The CT here in short axis, you can see that the valve sinuses are actually reasonably quite generous and that the coronary arteries are an adequate distance above the uh, annulus where we're likely to be landing the valve. So we felt fairly confident that we weren't likely to experience a problem with coronary obstruction and you can't see the VTC or valve uh, virtual tabby to uh, artery distance but it's more than four millimeters. So we've now crossed the aortic valve with an AL1 catheter um, via the femoral artery. There's a pigtail in through the arm and you can see that there's severe aortic regurgitation present. The ventricle also looks dilated with reduced contractility. There's a pacing wire from the leg into the right ventricle. So we now have a confiter wire in place in the left ventricle and you can see here we have an Edward Sapien 26 millimeter valve and we're trying to cross the bioprosthetic valve of the TAVI. We thought this would be quite straightforward without predilating with a balloon given the predominant regurgitation but for some reason the valve would not cross despite flexing considerably. We weren't sure whether we were getting caught up on the frame or the valve itself. So what we did was we then got contralateral access because we didn't want to take the valve out because if then the valve has to be thrown away. So we now have bifemoral access and we used a balloon to uh, dilate the um, bioprosthetic valve to try and create some more space. There's now two confiter wires in the left ventricle. Uh, interestingly, this still was not sufficient to allow us to cross uh, with our valve. We actually had to take this valve out and recross the uh, core valve. We presume we were in just either a small perforation in the leaflet or there was something uh, not quite right here. So we actually had to um, uh, prep another valve to do this. 
Following this, we were then able to cross quite easily with the Edwards valve. We positioned it just a little bit up from the inflow of the original valve and then balloon expanded it with rapid pacing. And so this was a 26 millimeter Sapien Ultra valve that we positioned there. And you can see the final position was really quite pleasing. We were aiming to pin the uh, core valve leaflets up and out of the way and uh, achieved our uh, desired position. So this is the follow-up uh, echo findings on this particular patient. You can see his left ventricle uh, now has low normal systolic function, so there's already been a dramatic improvement in the ejection fraction. The new valve is working really well. There's no significant gradient across the valve and just a mild paravalvular leak. So we were really uh, quite delighted that this had worked well. So when we're thinking about how we're going to manage these types of patients with failing TAVI valves, this is going to be an emerging conundrum for us. And this is a presentation from TBT a little while back. Uh, but this uh, TAV in TAV uh, issue is going to be steadily increasing for us. And so this Tavian failed surgical valves, we've already seen quite regularly. This is um, some data from the Vivid Registry from Danny DeVere's group. And the important findings from this are that there did appear to be some bias towards the self-expanding valve platform with core valve as compared to the Edward Sapien valve with an improved mortality. The other key element is that there are lower gradients across the um, the self-expanding valve platform and so probably the valve of choice for most valve in valves is going to be uh, a, um, a, um, a core valve. Uh, this is in a failed surgical valve though. So many of you will be familiar with Danny DeVere's app, which is this uh, used for these valve and valve type procedures. There's one for aortic and one for mitral, and this is very helpful. If you don't have this, you can easily download it from the app store and just gives you a lot of guidance as to how you might like to do these valve and valve procedures. So the challenges we face as we do valve and valve type procedures is the risk of coronary obstruction. The basilica technique has evolved with intentional laceration of the bioprosthetic valve leaflets so that coronary access can be maintained. This takes a careful analysis of the valve, sorry, the VTC distance, the virtual uh, TAVI to coronary distance, less than four millimeters, as I mentioned, is kind of the key number to remember. So this is the mechanism of coronary obstruction due to sinus sequestration in redo TAVI. And you can see that this is what happens when, first of all, you have a, uh, a sapien valve inside of a um, uh, evolute valve. And then if you look at evolute inside of evolute, there's a significant risk of substantial height of the skirt here causing uh, sinus sequestration sequestration and this is going to be related to the uh, diameter of the sinotubular junction so something you'll be very mindful of. So when we're doing TAVI we need to think carefully about uh, what is our first valve as well as what our second valve is going to be and where do we want to position that second valve. We're going to need to be com comfortable with cracking valves and uh, the uh, most valves can be cracked, but there's one or two that uh, no, that can't be. And so you need to be mindful of that before you make a choice about cracking a valve if there's pre-existing surgical um, prosthesis mismatch, which is not uncommon. And you can see here this valve has been cracked and that allows the uh, Evolute valve system to be placed. Um, some would argue that the Evolute should be placed first to avoid the potentially severe aortic regurgitation that will follow this. So with that, there's a lot of things for us to learn. Um, Tabby continues to grow and become safer with better valves and better choices. Um, we uh, haven't touched on the cusp overlap view with the Evolute system, but that is reducing pacemaker rates for our patients. Decisions around the choice of first valve is going to become increasingly important. We used to think that you could use either valve for most patients, but I think now we need to be much more mindful of where our patient's going to be in 10 years' time. And we will see increasingly frequent heavy valve failure and need for a valve in valve tabber. So with all of those things in mind, uh, thank you for your time and uh, listening to me. And uh, I hope to be able to join you in person next time. Thank you.